Good Tuesday afternoon. My name is Jerry Miller. Welcome to the I Love Seville show. Thank you kindly for joining us. Beautiful outside, and it's great to connect with you guys through the I Love Seville network. We're live in Charlottesville, Albemarle County, Central Virginia, the Commonwealth, the country, and the world. Today's guest, Monique Mosher, she's the owner of the Happy Cook and Barracks Road Shopping Center. This brand, one of the institutions and one of the truly evolving and successful brands and retail stores in Charlottesville and Central Virginia. We're going to spotlight that evolution and success story with Monique in T-minus 35 seconds. Before we do, we'll give, a, give you a snapshot about us. We are an advertising agency at I Love Seville and at VMV Brands. And as of this morning, we had 112 clients on our roster up and down the East Coast from New Providence, New Jersey, and the New Jersey Institute of Autism, all the way down to Asheville, North Carolina, with most of them in the Commonwealth and in Central Virginia. Two of our favorite clients, Interstate Pests and Service Companies and Scott Wagner Chiropractic and Sports Medicine, we've walked all, worked alongside those brands for almost eight years now. All aspects of those brands that interface with the marketplace originate on the second floor with our team in the Macklin Building. On the first floor in the Macklin Building, it's our studio where we do the I Love Seville show and what, nine, ten total shows each week. Um, Judah Wickhauer, we love working with Interstate. The business started in 1969 with the first generation, Mr. Wells, who used pay phones around Charlottesville and his personal truck to build a company. Now it has 100, almost 100 team members in a Commonwealth-wide working footprint. Interstate, we salute you for making Charlottesville a better place. Just like Scott Wagner, physical therapy, chiropractic care, Dr. Wagner has your back. Scott Wagner, chiropractic and sports medicine. I mentioned the name Judah Wickhauer. I want to give you a little history on him. He's the director of the show. He's worked at our business for almost eight years himself. He is fabulous. Um, and Judah, I appreciate you directing us and keeping us online. Uh, we'll thank some of the people that are watching, like Mike Condor, like Hank Dutton, Glenn Harrop is watching the program right now. I count eight different chefs watching the show. And I said Richmond, D.C., Charlotte, outside, folks outside Chicago, Illinois. It already questions coming in for Monique. Why don't we go to the studio camera here, Judah, uh, and welcome Monique to the program. Thank you for joining us on the show, Monique. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Um, same question. First question for all our guests. Introduce yourself to the viewing public, what you're all about, your passions, your hobbies, and your interests. Absolutely. Um, so my name is Monique Mosier. Um, I'm the owner of The Happy Cook with my husband, Steve. And um, we have owned The Happy Cook since 2005, so um, going on 15 years now. Um, we've been in the Charlottesville community for um, a few years more than that, so about 18 years um, that we've lived in Charlottesville. We have three kids that are five, seven, and nine. So um, between the happy cook and the three kids and then my husband's business, Bounce, Play, and Create, uh, we're very busy, um, very plugged in, and just love the Charlottesville community. Um, Amy Whalen, uh, stay-at-home parent, fabulous watcher of this program. She says, I love both Monique and Steve. Um, three kids and running two businesses. My yes. wife is the director of operations in this business. Right now, literally, she has our two-year-old on her right knee and an iPad or her laptop on her left knee. She's I get doing that. project <laughs> yeah. management. How in the heck do you do it with three kids uh, and yeah. two businesses? Yeah, I know. No, it's crazy. Yeah, but, uh, all three of my kids spent about a year in the Happy Cook as they were infant through one-year-old. So, yeah, I totally remember that. And, yeah, to this day, they're always in and out of the Happy Cook and bounce and helping us with tasks and I, I don't stop too often to think about how it's happening, just plug through, and um, it's fun to have the kids as part of the business, and I actually grew up uh, in small business as well in California. My parents owned book, a bookstore. As I grew up, I was in the bookstore, and so that kind of is very organic and sort of fun to see the same thing happen with my kids. Keith and Yona Smith in Fluvanna County just shared the show to their Facebook pages. Keith does Real Talk here on Friday mornings, um, a real, real estate-based show on the Isle of Seville Network. Um, messages coming in for you about your cooking classes already. We will get to these here and these comments. Um, how about your background? Correct me if I'm wrong. Does memory serve correct that you went to UVA? I did not. I actually okay. went to Sweetbriar College. Sweetbriar. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, all-girls school about, about an hour south 
south of here. Okay. So I worked at, I actually came from Sweetbriar um, and did research at the university. That's maybe what I'm Yeah, thinking. so I did have a UVA connection, and my husband, Steve, he actually got his master's at UVA. Okay. Um, so, um, but yeah, so I actually, that is, UVA is what brought us here originally to Charlottesville. Obviously, we were looking at it as a transitional thing. Sure. We were not expecting to stay here. It was more of a sort of like the next step after after college, and obviously that was 18 years ago. So uh, as, as Charlottesville does to so many people, um, yeah, we just loved it here, and here we are 18 years later. Charlottesville gets its hooks in you. Same with me. I've been here since 2000, came here as a first year. Um, how do you go to doing research at UVA to buying an institutional brand like the Happy Cook? Yeah, so it was totally an unplanned, never would have guessed it when, um, I mean, I graduated Sweetbriar with a degree in biochemistry and molecular biology, and um, was working in a research lab uh, in Charlottesville, and it had very kind of odd, it was research-based hours, so it was very kind of, I tended to work early mornings and was often done at like three in the afternoon and loved to cook. And so I actually, shortly after we moved to Charlottesville, I decided I wanted to have a part-time job at the Happy Cook, just partially because I had a brand new kitchen with not much stuff in it. And I thought this would be great to have an employee discount to, to work there in the afternoons while um, my husband was working, but I didn't have anything going on. And um, so I started working at the Happy Cook pretty much in 2002, right when we moved here, just part-time couple days a week um, and stocking my kitchen up. And um, as I was working at the Happy Cook and the current owner at that time was the, the Van Cleefs, uh, Tammy was the um, primary owner. And she, um, over the course of time, decided she was not, it was not what she was looking for. She was looking to do something else. And um, I started to decide that the research thing was not what I was wanting to do long term. My, like I mentioned, my parents owned small businesses, and it's so growing up in that environment compared to a nine or it wasn't nine to five, but still a structured job was very foreign to me and very different. I wasn't really enjoying it like I thought I might. And so when she was discussing the fact that she was interested in selling the business, that was that was when I said, well, I think we need to talk because I think this would be something maybe I have more interest in doing rather than continuing down the research road. So that was that was how I ended up moving from science over to retail. Um, give it a like and a share on 12 Facebook pages. Derek Wells has liked the page. I see Steve, your husband, has liked the page, is watching right now. Grace is watching in Ivy um, as we speak. A lot of folks in Crozet. Tom Bow watching the program. Uh, from Take It Away Sandwich Shop, um, throw this to you. How does an owner of a business start a conversation with someone who's working part-time in a business, <laughs> who openly admits is working in the business for probably the employee discount <laughs> to stock her deluxe kitchen? Right. How do you have the conversation, I'm going to buy you out of your business? Well, it was, I mean, it was one of those things that I worked with Tammy for three years before I took over. Okay. So um, she knew my background in business. And so like, as I was working there, I, like I said, I kind of started just working retail a couple afternoons a week and it sort of turned into me taking on some responsibilities, helping her out with some things. Tammy was not necessarily... I would say not super, it, she had bought the business without any business experience in that type of realm of retail, so I was kind of helping her with some things, so it was sort of an organic evolution of starting out just working there, w helping customers, and then taking on some responsibilities that she approached me about it, knowing that there was some interest in, in that realm, so. Will and Erica Taylor from Chick-fil-A and Fashion Square Mall, welcome to the program. They're liking the show. Same with Vicki Stockcamp. Um, talk to us about the uh, happy cook when you start working part-time and then you take over. When my family's gone in and shopped at your store, the thing that strikes you immediately about your business is the phenomenal customer service. I mean, your team members are so well coached. Yeah. And so well, like, you know, so positively interacting with the customers. And they're like that perfect line of like not being like over persistent, but being there when you need help and not having to look for somebody for answers. Right. What it struck you about this, about purchasing this brand? Yeah, I mean, definitely that was something I feel like Happy Cook has always been like the customer service has always been what set it apart. And that was something that was there and organic when I there was definitely not any sort of change that we did. But I think the biggest thing that 
I made a, a bit of an adjustment to is I think that the focus of the business um, 15 years ago before we took over was a little bit more of a designer kind of, well, Tammy was a designer previously, so it was more about aesthetics and a little bit less about function, utility. When I took over, I have always loved to cook, and I always I wanted us to be a serious source for equipment. Um, it was really important to me that all the staff knew about the products from a very kind of utilitarian type of perspective. So somebody could walk in and ask, you know, it's not it's beyond the question of where do I find this, but it's like this is the thing I'm doing with it. I'm going to use this tool for. I need to peel butternut squash. Which peeler is going to work specifically for that? Is there any techniques that I should know about. So we focus on training everybody to make sure that they know the ins and outs of the products, how to use it, how to relay that to customers. And that was, I think, something I had a little bit more emphasis on um, than previously that I've we've evolved into. But I think that was worked out well for us with the uh, with the retail market as it is. Obviously, that's now one of the key things that keeps us viable is that, you know, on Amazon you can check reviews, but you don't know who these people are. Random people putting reviews out there. A lot of times the reviews are placed, so you can't even trust them. Exactly. You have no idea if they're a trustable source. You have no idea if they even know how to cook. So like they're saying that something doesn't work, well maybe they don't actually know how to use the tool the correct way, and maybe that's why they're giving a negative review. So I mean, you you have to be very careful about that, and then if you go into big box stores, you're not going to get any information about why you should pick one item over another. So luckily that led well into where we are today, because that's one thing that people love about the Happy Cook is they can come in and have a constructive conversation. We are the experts in these things. We're using these things in our cooking school where, you know, our staff is all testing and using these things on a regular basis. So people can know who they're getting critique from rather than just following some random people's reviews online, which you have no idea what you can trust or not. That's super cool. So we'll thank some of the viewers. Um, Director of Operations, Aaron King from Feast. Um, and the Main Street Market watching here. Neil Crowder outside Richmond, Virginia is watching. Our friends at Citizen Burger Bar are watching. Chefs over at Junction Restaurant in Belmont watching the program as we speak. Um, I am struck by the sense of community at the Happy Cook. Um, I think it's super um, inviting and intimate and a knowledge base and like roll up your sleeves and get like some this is how you go about doing it um, experience. That's particularly important for someone like me who often goes in because his better half loves to, you know, outfit the kitchen where she loves to spend her time, and I don't know a lot about it. So if I go in and I have questions, I get answers that are clear and get pointed in the right direction. I want to go down that road. Before we do, when you, you said, was it 2002? We moved to Charlottesville in 2002. Okay. We purchased the business in 2005. So in 2005, what was the Barracks Road Shopping Center and the retail landscape like in 2005? Um, I mean, well, so Happy Cook in 2005 was in its older corner location um, that has changed a bit since we've been there and um, was kind of nestled on all three sides by Banana Republic. And that's the location that had been in ever since it was started. So we were there since 1978. Um, So it was a very different, Happy Cook was very different in its appearance and outlook because we were in 1,200 square feet. So it was tiny and kind of cramped and a little bit claustrophobic. Um, Obviously, Barracks Road, that was, you know, I would say 2005 through 2008. I mean, it was, Mm. you know, retail was hopping all over, um, you know, all over Charlottesville. I know in 2008, a lot of things changed. So it's uh, definitely, I mean, Charlottesville in general had that decline after that. But I would say 2005 was right in the peak. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's not too much different than it is. It's still right the now. hot spot. It's the best yeah. shopping district. Yeah, it's not, by I far. would say it's not, I would say it's not too much different than it was then. A happy cook was substantially different than what it is now. Our, our current location is, uh, much more open, much more space. And it was a space that, you know, the old location, everything was kind of designed around making that location work. The new location was designed about doing what I wanted to do with the store long term and making that fit. So it's so much better utilization of the space and everything um, as it as it is today. I have so much respect for you and Steve and your family because you guys are unafraid to take risk. 
Um, we have taken, and I don't think the average person realizes how much, and I'm not marginalizing anybody, but it realizes how much ridiculous risk the businesswoman or the businessman or the entrepreneur behind a company has to take. Yeah. I mean, it's obscene risk in a lot mm -hmm. of cases. And you guys have taken, like, just off the top of my head, expanded square feet in arguably the most expensive shopping district in Charlottesville that's justified. Mm -hmm. You guys tried the Artisan's Market. Mm -hmm. Is that brand the right name, the Artisan's mm -hmm. Market? You guys bought Bounce. Mm -hmm. um, you guys opened a cooking school. Mm -hmm. You first started with cooking classes. I mean, you're not afraid to change or pivot the model. No, we, and, I, and, and that was actually, like, Artisan Market was a great example. That was just taking advantage of an opportunity. Barracks came to us and said, hey, we got North this space. North Barracks. Yeah, bar yeah, it was the North uh, Barracks Road. Um, they were like, we got this spot. Do you want it for a little bit? <laughs> Can you think of something to do? And that is thanks to Steve. He's the one who, he jumps on stuff. So he didn't tell me. He was like, yeah, we'll take it. Let's, we'll figure something out. <laughs> so Steve like totally said, yeah, we'll absolutely take this spot. We'll do a temporary lease there until you find a tenant and we'll find something to do with it. Then it was, uh, then it was just between him and I to figure out what, when the heck are we going to put in there? But it was great. It was so much fun. It was a very different thing because we were working with local artists and so we met all sorts of people from all realms between we knew people in that community because a lot of people we do a lot of local things that are in the kitchen realm sure but this was you know furniture and jewelry it and was like it was an like, elevated farmer's market meets art gallery yes. in a space that has easy parking that's right. accessible and approachable yeah so it was it was super fun it was a really unique experience it was uh we met all sorts of people which we still keep up with today um but yeah that was it was it was a great way to to utilize a hey have this spot for a year see what you can do with it so um but yeah steve steve's definitely the one he he loves to to jump on that type of stuff so i i tend to be a little more conservative more analytical and he's like sure we'll take it <laughs> so but but it was it was a lot of fun that pretty much epitomizes the dynamic between my wife and i to a t yeah um I throw this to you expanding the square foot the square feet the footprint mm -hmm. of the happy cook mm -hmm. i mean that right there is risk yeah and that that was i mean because we went um it was like i said 1200 square feet in an attic which had a roof that like i couldn't stand up in so imagine somebody and that's a, back storage that was upstairs okay so we had upstairs attic space that you could but we utilized it well, but that was our original space. Okay. When we moved into our current space, we went up to a little over 4,000 square feet total. Good night. Um, a lot of storage, yeah. um, office, um, and then the retail. Um, and that was, I, honestly, we approached Federal Realty as pretty much as soon as we took the business over and just said, look, we have a vision for Happy Cook that's not going to work in this space. Yes, it's where we've been since 1978, but... Moving forward, we have new things in mind, and um, so that was, um, we told them, and they were basically, and we, we knew we didn't want to move far. We knew we wanted to be as close to the, our current location was as possible. We didn't want to move over to North Wing. We didn't want to have a, a large um, jump, and so we kind of put that on their radar, and then they reached out to us a couple years later and found it had they actually put kind of two spaces together to make what we needed, and um, that's where we are. What was the with the vision? Why make the move? Besides needing more space. I mean, you we, wanted to do more community stuff. We felt like the new space was necessary because in its old location, we couldn't really be much more than a boutique kitchen shop. It was too, We were a serious kitchen shop, but in that location it had a vibe of a boutique cook kitchen store, not a serious. We wanted to do cooking classes, and we knew that that would never be possible. But it was really the need to be able to be an expansive, like, serious, you know. I mean, we could see, you know, Charlottesville was changing. I mean, heck, this was, we moved into our current space over 10 years ago. So uh, even at that point, you know, things were on the horizon. Um, so you did Stonefield. this in the recession? Yes, we did Good that. Good Lord, you like, have guts. Smack in the middle of it. So we, um, we, you know, for so long, there was all these rumors about what was happening with what turned into Stonefield. I, you know, it's, it's sold and changed so many times. But we knew about, about that back actually when we bought the business and we knew that likely either Sir Latabo Williams Doma would be there now we it took a heck of a lot longer <laughs> to actually open than we thought it would um, we thought it was newer on the horizon but we knew to be viable we needed to be 
we needed to be a serious cooking store that didn't feel boutique-y. And that was what was going to be needed was to, to do the larger space that we ended up doing in 2009. But yeah, I mean, it was one of those things that we, we did it even though it was in a, not a great time to do it. But um, we knew that that was the right spot. When Federal came to us and was like, we have this, we can combine this, we can make this space for you, it was like hands down, we, does, we gotta do it. Like this is the right spot for the happy cook. Um, and so you kinda gotta, yeah, gotta take those risks. When the right thing comes up, you gotta do it when you got it, because the next you know, opportunity that that's gonna come through, who knows. John Neal, the commercial real estate broker is watching. Chef, um, executive chef Laura Fawner, who's taken over Dooner's Restaurant is watching. Christopher Eagle, the real estate agent is watching here. Um, 11 chefs watching the program now. Um, I'll throw this to you. When you're expanding, I love to ask kind of like the, the vulnerable question, the sense of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. When you're going from, you said 1,200 square feet mm -hmm. to 4,000 square mm -hmm. feet, does that kind of move keep you up at night? Um, yes and no. I mean, it, we knew it had to happen. Like it, it was just, we knew that yeah. we felt like to be viable long term, it was a necessity. Yeah. Like, you know, to some extent to not do it, probably would have kept me up, you know, to say no, probably would have kept me up long. If we had been like, no, I just, this isn't the right time. We can't do it. I think that would have been what stressed me out because it would have been like, oh crud, did we just say no to something that's going to end up being like the death pen to us? So I think we, we knew that, I mean, Charlottesville is such a foodie community, so supportive of local businesses. Like we knew if we were able to offer Charlottesville what we had a vision for, we knew that we would succeed in that. We felt very confident about that. So uh, we felt like we were just moving in the direction the right that direction. was necessary. That's where we had to go. How does that happen? Like, how do you, what's the transition like? Like, because you have to have open doors to pay salaries. We were, pay we were only closed for one day. How did you do that? It was kind of crazy, but yeah. Uh, I mean, one of the things was is that basically, the new space was built out over a couple months okay. and had mostly all new fixtures. So it was kind of staged. And because we expanded so much, uh -huh. there was a lot of new product okay. that was going into that space. So we literally closed one day and the few shelving units and displays that had to move over went over first thing in the morning and then the rest of that day, it was just like, I mean, it was across the crosswalk. So it wasn't a very sure. far move, yeah. but it literally, everybody who was on staff was working that day and everything went across the street and was nestled into its pre-planned space where we knew it was going to be. And then we were open the next day. So we, um, yeah, so we, we were open up in the old space up until there was one transition day. And then, then opened awesome. up in the new space. So, yeah, we've always been very uh, conscious of trying to um, pre... I'm, I'm a planner. I'm very analytical. So I was able to kind of have everything orchestrated so it was as least disruption as possible, which... Yeah, you can't ask for much less than that. <laughs> no, that's amazing. Uh, Jenny Street is giving you some love. Um, your family of yours, Chris Belcher, welcome to the pro welcome to the program now. Um, Eugene Fitzgerald, welcome to the show. Charlotte, North Carolina, is definitely watching. Same with Raleigh in Hendersonville, North Carolina. I'll, let me throw this to you. What was it? Um, how did the community respond to the new space? Yeah, I mean that was I guess the one that would be the thing that maybe kept you up at night was the fact that it, it you know, like you said, two thousand nine was a terrible yeah. economic situation. Um, people are just trying to pay rent and mortgages. Right, right. And we were doing this, right. And so I mean, but the thing was, the reality was it was huge. I mean, we had a huge rest of that year. So we moved mid year, so it was like uh, June, I believe, that we opened up. And it was I mean, everybody was just so excited to see the new space. Um we ended up just having huge numbers because even though it was, I think we bucked the negative economy because everybody was coming out to check out the new store. Cool. And so it was, we did not end up net having any, it was just growth. Um, so we did not end up with any downtick because of, um, because of that. I think just because of how much excitement there was about the new space, the new offerings, we, Start, I mean, we, we, are, we doubled our retail square footage. So there was a ton of products that we, brands that we never carried at all before that we brought in. The big thing, we never did tabletop before, dishes and plates and things like that. We did a huge amount of that into the new space. And 
variety of other categories that we hadn't, we just maybe did very small. So, um, I mean, yeah, it was, it was very, right off the bat, we knew, we knew immediately it was the right move because it was highly successful. We had tons of traffic, even in the summer, which is obviously in Charlottesville, um, you know, sleepy and not great. So that, that, that first Christmas, though, was, that was where we really saw that this absolutely was the right move. And people telling us, oh, I'm so glad you're in this new space. I, I, was, a little, I was always a little claustrophobic, and I never felt comfortable coming in there. I never realized how many people kind of stayed away just because of how small. And they, in Christmas, it would be like, you know, wall to wall, nobody could move. And so many people who'd be like, I wouldn't go in there because it was just too crowded. And so now being able to have wide aisles that strollers could navigate and um, people in wheelchairs and that there was more flow. Um, there was a substantial, um, it was a huge uptick. So, so yeah, ever since then, it's, it's, um, that, that was, it was definitely the right move at the right time, even though it was not, uh, you would think not a great time, but it was, it worked out very well for Do us. Do we, are we insulated from national trends in Charlottesville because of UVA? Or I mean, are we definitely. Not? Yeah? Yes and no. Okay. I mean, I would say if you talk to owners, you know, citywide, um, I mean, it was not a great time. <laughs> I mean, there were definitely people who were, were feeling the impacts of the recession. I would, I would say that, yes, we do get that buffered. Like, I think that, yes, that I think that, you know, we weren't losing big, you know, jobs and stuff like other communities just because the university does, you know, buffer that. But, you know, people were seeing hits to their 401ks and their investments. Sure. And, I mean, people were not feeling super shopping friendly during that time because I think there were people were feeling the squeeze of everything that was going on nationally. You mentioned down the street, William Sonoma, William Sonoma opens mm -hmm. in Stonefield. Mm -hmm. um, you guys, I'm going to straight up say it, dominate them. Yeah, thank you. We you, think we do you too. You dominate them. Yeah. Customer service, you dominate yeah. them by far. Um, what's going through the family's mind and, and, and your mind with them, a, a global brand, right? Opening what, less than a mile. Yeah, I imagine. Yeah, that's D pretty darn close. Down so. the road. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, definitely. I mean, we weren't excited to have them open up. I mean, obviously, we'd rather not have them there. It's better to be the, the kitchen the shop only, yeah. in, in Charlottesville. But we also, um, we are um, a member of a, a group uh, that is sort of like, a, it's a buying group of other independent kitchen shops around the country. Um, there's, I think, 180 stores. We, do, we, we, have, we have meetings once a year and such. And so I'm friends with people who own businesses all across the country, just like mine. So we did know other people who had Williams Sonoma's close to them or in their same shopping center and stuff. And so there was a, there was obviously a, a concern, but also knowing from them, they're a very different store. I mean, um, they're definitely much more about the image of being a Williams Sonoma customer and the lifestyle image that that is compared to um, what we offer is is more about knowledge based and it's it's a very it, both similar and not like it's very different and I so I we weren't overly concerned like I said obviously you always would prefer to be the only game in town um, but it, it wasn't like we were overly stressed about it. I mean we felt like particularly being positioned where we were with the space that we had I did I was that was one of the things that facilitated us moving from the smaller space I did feel like people would dismiss us as not that serious of a cooking shop if you're just in that tiny little location we were but when it came down to them opening I think they opened in like 2015 ish I think was around the time that that they opened like we were not overly concerned we ended up the year they opened actually was um our biggest year that nice. we that we ever had. So it, it wasn't. It, I mean, it, I, our, we are far more concerned about Amazon and the just the general change in shopping trends and habits of people. That's a much bigger player, I think, in like where we are focused than William Sonoma, um, because they are just uh, a, a, you know they they definitely have their core customers who probably were never our customers anyway and would just shop. Um, through their catalog or their website anyway. So, um, Shane Baker Sirbati, um is giving you the heart emoji, and she says shop local, and she loves the happy cook. Louise Monk is watching the program, and she says I love to visit this store anytime I'm in Charlottesville, Virginia. 
Um, we have Laura Carini that's watching in Roanoke that she's a UVA graduate and she says anytime I come to Charlottesville I try to swing by the Happy Cook. It's one of my favorite stores. Jamie Beeler, welcome to the program. Give it a like and a share on any of the streams that you're watching. I might mess up this person's name but Mahaba Buba Qatar is watching the program as we speak. Um, you mentioned Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the th item that primarily or the competitor that primarily concerns you. Open-ended mm -hmm. question there. Talk mm -hmm. to us about how you combat this beast. I mean, what we've looked at is we have changed, and this is something that we've done probably in the last three years or so in our, the way we approach our product selection. So we used to be more of the mindset that you know, people would come in, they'd be looking for a garlic press in general. And we wanted to have lots of options so that people can say, okay, these are the five garlic presses that we have and talk to them about what the different ones are. And um, we might have in the back of our people, would, we would have our favorite ones, but we wanted to have a, a robust offering. So nowadays, people don't come in looking for a garlic press. Often, a lot of people are coming in looking for the ba 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 ba, -ba, -ba garlic press. And you don't have it, and they say, hmm, bummer. You're talking the specific brand. Yeah, specific brand okay. could be specific handle, I mean, okay. like very highly specific. Okay. And they will go, oh, bummer. I love shopping local. I thought I'd check with you first, but I'm just going to go ahead and buy it on Amazon. Okay. And that's fine. I understand. That's the mentality nowadays. People, a lot of people are looking at reviews on blogs. They have their, their favorite you know, blog that they follow and they have this thing that they love and they recommend. And so people often are coming for a very specific item. Well, we obviously can't carry, you know, I'm sure Amazon carries, you know, thousands of garlic presses. We can't carry every one that somebody might come in. So what we've decided to do is make our selection be about our curated selection. These are our favorites. These are the ones that we're behind. These are the one. These are the tools for any given category that's being used in our cooking school that we love. And so, what we're there for is if you're coming in and you're saying, "I need a garlic press. Talk to me about your garlic presses." We are going to tell you these are the three garlic presses that are the best. And so, we've really worked on not focusing on trying to have everything for everyone, which we maybe did a little bit. Previously, we tried to do that more, and what we focused on doing is saying, these are the ones we like. These are the ones we're behind. These are the ones we use in the cooking school, and you're going to want to get one of these three because we can tell you this reason, da, 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 da. And so we've just sort of changed how we do our purchasing to try to focus on it being all about the specific things that we're you know, interested in. Um, obviously, um, and, and so w when we decided that one of the things that we wanted to do was really knock out of the park cooking classes, that was something that we did. We did ever since we opened in 2009, but we did it in the retail space. And so it wasn't its own designated space. We were be open and doing classes, so it was kind of could be distracting, and it was kind of cramped, and we couldn't really do much in the way of hands-on, and we couldn't really do private events. It was very limited. But we were still doing two or three cooking classes a week, but it wasn't ideal. So we decided that we were going to build out our cooking school that we did, and what we did is we decided, we're like, well, we know we need to do the cooking school. What we want to do is, because we are becoming more curated in our selection, we were able to not drop any categories, even though we actually did designate what was retail space to the cooking school and change around our displays. And if, you know, if in every specific item we went from five to three, we were able to shrink what we were carrying, and it was all the things that we loved. It was all the, ex the items that we were behind. And so we're still, you know, people are coming in, and they're looking for the green Kuhn Rakan, blah, 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 you know, garlic press. We still don't have that, but we're, like I said, we're never going to be that. So w what's best for us is the people who are like, come in and say, you know, I'm looking for a good garlic press, and then we can talk to them about what we have. And so many of our customers, they know that they can trust us and that we're giving them good recommendations. And, and that's where we are able to kind of, you know, strive. And we, we always, from a price perspective, um, 
most of our companies have what's called map policies, minimum allowed pricing, uh -huh. and we always price at that. So, uh -huh. I mean, Amazon can be crazy and they can go up and they can go down. And every once in a while, we're selling stuff at half the price of Amazon, but then two days later, they're selling it for 50 cents less than us. So sure. all of, we try to, you can never know, but our pricing is very competitive and we are always, our prices aren't changing. <laughs> so, you know, we're giving a good, fair price that's what's recommended by the manufacturer. Sometimes those matrices get crazy on Amazon, but um, but you know, people, we are offering things at a fair price, so you don't have to worry about that. We're I definitely... love I love that answer. I think it's so smart. So one of the one of the many value propositions of shopping at the Happy Cook, you guys have vetted the products your, yourself. Mm -hmm. You've tested the products yourself. So you're coming in and speaking with either you or your staff or Steve or whoever it may be. And the products that you recommend, you actually have tangible experience working with the product. So it goes from Joe Schmo in Arizona right. writing a review about this garlic press to me, Monique, in Charlottesville, right. who you're talking to, right. has used this garlic press. This is the one to buy. I would pay literally a premium for that right because there's nothing worse than getting something than having to go through the mm -hmm. hassle return because my time's my most precious commodity right do people under under appreciate that i mean we definitely our core customers do i mean we yeah. definitely have a lot of customers who are coming in who are you know they're just saying hey let, I, this is what i'm looking for what should i get um and you know it it, it just depends on the personality of what some, you know some people that they want to i think that it's becoming I think there's a trend back to that. I agree. I think that people are becoming, even millennials are becoming more wanting to have that interaction. I think that it's started to go so far with the lack. I think it's starting to circle back. We got burned yeah. is what happened. And right. I, I myself it, it can speak to this. Where yeah. I went through this mindset and this phase where I was literally getting burned by the stuff that I was buying online, right. where I was saving like a couple of bucks on a SKU, and then I'd have to go through the, I, the, the process right. of returning it or it would break. Right. So now I'm just like, I want to pay for quality. Right. Well, and the other thing that's interesting is there's a lot of um, stuff with Amazon, back-end stuff that I'm aware of with regards to, mostly this is information I've gotten from vendors uh -huh. of my but Amazon's a murky place. I mean, vendors pop up, vendors pop out. They go away. There's things that all the time that they have one picture on that they're posting that they're selling and something else is coming in the mail to you. And I think that more people are aware of that because like you said, they've had interactions where they thought they were buying this and they're like, what the heck is this that just showed up at my door? Um, but there's a lot, you know, a lot of, there. You, it is, it's a little bit of the Wild West. I mean, I know at one point, for instance, one of our big manufacturers, um, Vustoff, um, the knife company, they went through a couple of years that they didn't sell to Amazon, period. Did not ship them anything. But during that entire time, there was always product from Amazon.com for sale. And all of this merchandise was not coming from Vustoff. And so it was knockoffs. It, uh, they referred to it as most often gray merchandise. What's gray, gray, mar gray, gray market. It could be coming through a shadow purchaser. It could be something that was a freight delivery that went missing. Um, there's a lot of funny stuff that goes on. That is where, I mean, they used to mark knives. They, Vustoff themselves would actually label it so that they could find it. So they would buy the stuff from Amazon and then track who, who bought it or got it from them. Right. So they, I mean, like, it's like a whole, but I, particularly, I think, a few years ago, nobody thought anything but super positive things about Amazon. I think that more everyday people are starting to, like you said, have had these interactions where they're like, what is this? And, you know, that's not what I, you know, was purchasing and finding out about or these robo, right. Coming, finding out about these robo, um, like the reviews that are totally bogus yeah. that are just, you Planted. know, planted reviews that you're reading these reviews and then you're looking at this product and going, there is no way that this got 1500 yeah. five star reviews. This thing is a piece of junk. Right. And, and you I can think, almost tell now. Yeah. I think now that we're, people are more aware of that, you can see that, but you know, it's, it's how much time are you mm. spending looking at 15 different products? And you're like, is this fake review? Is this a real review? Touche. And you know, or you could just go to your local retailer and talk to somebody real and pick up the product in hand and walk home with it and use it that evening for dinner. So I think that that is bringing things back a little bit. And so I think, um, I think there is some aspect of that that's 
shifting. You have a lot of uh, friends and customers watching. I'm going to thank some of them that are watching. Mary Blake, welcome to the show. Kimberly Anderson is giving you props. Katie Brown, giving you some props right now. Kathleen Pierce, um, liking what she's hearing. Lauren is liking what she's hearing and says, I enjoy shopping at the Happy Cook. Bobby Castine, uh, Leticia Curry Stinney, James Watson, Amanda Traplowski, Bashir from Bashir's on the Downtown Mall is watching the show now. Um, so, what is the future? I've said this many times on the show, and I'll say it yeah. again. I've said it, you guys and Patty Zeller at the Animal Connection are mm -hmm. the market leaders in retail in Charlottesville and creating the experiential retail experience, pivoting the model. Let me throw you're smarter than I am when it comes to this. What is experiential retail? And is experiential retail even the right terminology, do you think? I think so. Yes, I think I, I. I mean, I think that that is definitely something that's talked about. Is that using that terminology? And I think that is right. I mean, so in other words, the idea behind the fact that you're doing more than the transaction of money and product. It's about what you're getting, the intangible stuff that you're getting from that transaction, which is. Which is, I mean, if all you care about is that you get the product and you're giving a, somebody money, then that is, Amazon is perfect for that. You can do it while you're, you know, sitting out in front of your kid's school waiting to pick them up and it shows up at your door a day or two later. But what we're offering is not only uh, the experience of the knowledge of, you know, I, we've, lo we've spent a lot of time making the Happy Cook feel like just a happy place to be. So just from a perspective of just enjoying that shopping experience and being with other people who are foodies and talking about in general what you're doing. Um, the cooking school we feel like has just taken that to the next level. So now it's all about being able to get people in there and play with the stuff themselves. Taking cooking classes, learning new techniques, using the different tools, being able to um, focus on just we we look at ourselves as just sort of the the haven of people who love food. It's like an epicenter. Yeah, exactly. Between the fact that you can take classes and learn new skills and learn about doing new stuff, and and then we also we we've we've wanted to do a lot more with the cooking school than just that, in the sense that. We have things like um, what are called our workshops, where maybe you're just playing with certain gadgets and you're learning about how do I use a spiralizer and playing with it and using them and getting to get a m almost like a demo, but it's more hands-on in our cooking school space. We've had a lot of our manufacturers have come in and done cooking classes. They've been able to highlight their brands that people are able to learn more about those products, taste delicious foods, learn lots of tricks about how to use the things and so it's, we, we're trying to just go bigger and make it so people, when they think about food and cooking and doing things at home in their kitchen, that we are right there on their minds um, here in Charlotte. That's been, that's been our goal. Um, another thing, and Montreal Simmons is watching. I believe he was your general manager at one time at Bounce. He's mm -hmm. an entrepreneur yeah. now. Um, I'll throw this question to you. You are phenomenal at building a brand. Like you Thank are you. phenomenal <laughs> at working social. You're phenomenal at t telling the story behind the brand, creating content. Mm -hmm. We were talking about this off air. I feel like, I mean, you undoubtedly realize that uh, uh, business is now in 2020 more than just a store. It's a brand. Yeah. Like people want to hear the story behind it. Give me some insight into that. And then the op entrepreneurs that are watching the show the importance of that. Right. Well, I mean, it's definitely important. I mean, definitely in today's world, um, you know, people are interacting with social media throughout the day. And like I said, I want, I think that's an integral part in us being on their minds when they're cooking and they're doing their things. And I think, you know, one of the things that makes it, I, I feel like um, it's not that I'm doing anything super savvy. It's just that it's an organic expression of the happy cook is an it's organic genuine. expression of me and my family and Steve and who we are. And so all I'm really doing on Facebook or Instagram. It's being you. Yes. It's just focusing on the things I love, the new product that I'm excited to show everybody, the fun cooking class that's going on that we're excited to share with everybody. So it is, it's, it's, I don't think I'm doing anything per se, you know, super unique except for just sharing the things that I love about my business, which is an expression of who I am and what we do every day. And I, I think being genuine, I think is, is the most important thing. And that's why it comes off that way, because it is. Um, Barracks Road Shopping Center. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I've been in Charlottesville since 2000. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, it's a first year at UVA. When I first got here, I remember the cigar shop. Yeah. Um, I remember, um, uh, you know, a lot of Lynn Goldman. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were, I'll throw this to you and I'll get out of the way. There were more local merchants and Barrick's Road Shopping Center. Yeah, um, I Barrick's, would say that's true. Barrick's Road Shopping Center, the best shopping district in the region by far. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, I remember, I remember uh, probably five, maybe ish plus years ago, um, the people who I can't remember who the real estate group was, but them coming to Barracks Road and uh-huh. they're building out this new shopping center on oh, hydraulic. They tried a federal. Oh, gotcha. They, okay. This was the who became Stonefield, but I can't okay. remember. It, it's sold so many times. I'm not sure who who it was. Yeah. Which, which real estate group? Now it's a private equity group out of New York. Yeah. I mean, They've it's contacted changed us so many times. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. So they came in and they're like, "We're we're opening the shopping center of Charlottesville, and you are gonna want to get out of here." And they were doing dinners and they were smoozing people and talking about how Barracks Road was going to be a ghost town. That's kind of dirty. Oh, it was. And so they were they were contacting every the active tenants. Oh yes, every oh, every gosh. single local they were inviting to dinner and they were you know. Talking about how this is going to be the end of Barracks Road and da 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 da, da and, and trying to schmooze everybody into going up to Stonefield, and um, and it was uh, and I remember thinking to myself, oh. first off, I knew Federal Realty; I'd had a long term experience with them already at that point, and I thought this isn't. I first off, Federal knows how to run a shopping center, and there's no way they're going to let that happen. And um, obviously, leasing agents will tell you anything you want to hear to try to get you to yeah. <laughs> sign. So I never t- trust anything a leasing agent um, tells me. But um, but There's it was a few of them watching the yeah, show right well, now. Well, I'm saying okay. You know, okay I still, I, so I need to fact check you. That's all I'm saying. Um, but I knew at that point that their what they were saying there was no way that was coming because I just knew that Barracks was. Um, was definitely going to be in a different place just because of how savvy federal realty is. And, and, you know, I remember some of my friends who were from, who went to UVA saying they don't remember, and I don't know your experience from being there. They were like, I don't remember anything other than Barracks Road. Like they are like that. That's all I remember. Yeah. They don't go very far away from that. I took the bus to teeter. Yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly. Like that sort of, and I was like, you know, whatever. I don't really believe what you're saying, but I do think that they had an impact. Uh I do think, I don't think that people necessarily there were some that went up to Stonefield yeah but I do think that they I do think that that impacted uh-huh. what was going on because I think that people started going hmm you know I, I think I do feel like there was a bit of a turn there of people saying well what if is this going to happen what is gonna it's gonna look like when Stonefield opens up yeah and I think they did kind of stir some some negativity among some of the, particularly the small business owners who were, um, who were being, you know, solicited by Stonefield, even though not that many ended up actually going there. Sure. I do think that was sort of a little bit of a beginning of some. Um, I think you're hundred percent right. So I remember, and here's what I remember is like, so, um, you know, on a lot of this building downtown, big with the DBAC. Mm-hmm. Okay. We downtown, business owners were terrified of Stonefield mm-hmm. and Fifth Street Station. Yeah. Two huge shopping quarters kind within of sandwiching, what, yeah. like three, mi- four miles mm-hmm. less of downtown. So I remember the conversation being like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. It created fear. Right. And that fear created people, influenced people to do things as opposed to be patient and wait to see how the marketplace actually mm-hmm. responded to the new shopping centers. Right. And I'm not knocking Stonefield, but I will say this. The traffic flow is not great. <laughs> no. They have overvalued the value proposition of the movie theater mm-hmm. and what it has to offer Let's cut to the chase. People aren't going to the movies as much as they used to. And when they are going to the movies, they're not window shopping as much as they used to. And the rents are based on that. Right. Um, So I think we're going to see the rents in that district eventually go down a little bit. um, Mm. And the turnover in the district justifies that. The question I have for you is Barracks Road is without question the top player in the market. 
yeah. shopping wise. When you guys get this freaking Chick fil A coming here with two drive throughs, you're going to have, and we mentioned this in that Bricks post, and we have mm -hmm. people asking about the Bricks post. You're going to have the top three, you're going to have Chick fil A in Barracks mm -hmm. Road is going to be the top grossing restaurant. Probably. In Charlottesville. I, I mean, guess. it's ridiculous. Yeah, with its proximity to, to UVA. To UVA, guaranteed. two drive throughs, and in Barracks Road. Yeah, because I know that Chipotle does crazy. They UVA. crush it. Yeah. They crush it. Okay, so throw, you're the pro here. Mm -hmm. The rents in Barracks, you undoubtedly say, justified mm -hmm. you I talked think, about this in the post yeah i i mean i agree i mean i i, I definitely i i mean they they're getting what they can get because they can get it you know what there i mean is. that that's the reality of it i mean i know the discussion was about that um the bricks location and honestly i mean i know that zinberger is crushing it right they are crushing it right down the way yeah and it's probably going to be another you know i think they're a regional chain uh -huh. that's not national i think but mid-atlantic i believe um and i my gut says it's probably going to be somebody in that type of vein who wants to be on emmett street close to jpj your take on this was so reasonable you're like and, and i don't want to you know steal your thunder island pad yeah drive by on emmett with signage viewable from emmett yeah i mean that's a that's a huge that's i mean that that's why there's a high premium on that because that is i mean that I can't imagine too many other spots in all of the region, in all of Charlottesville yeah. that are as desirable as that, except for Chipotle and where the Chick-fil-A is going and Zinberger. I mean, I know that they, there is massive traffic in the barracks road area. And whenever there's a JPJ event, whether it's a basketball game, whether it's a, you know, entertainment related thing. I mean, there's tons of people they're not supposed to, but who park, go to dinner, and then walk to JPJ. Yeah. I mean, every, I do that all the every time. <laughs> single, and, and, and you know, I guess technically if you're eating dinner there, it's okay. That's how I patron. justify it, but, is but I get some beers at but, Zimberger. Right, but seriously, I mean, that's what they're advertising, is the amount of traffic that, and then that, that, that bricks pad is right in that mix. I mean, you could go to dinner there, and it's a quick walk to JPJ. And obviously, like we said, a lot of UVA students don't know much too much outside of Barracks Road, but they're going to know about that place. Yeah. Um, and and you know, whenever there's events where the parents are in town, you know, so I mean, to me, it, it it's not well, it's not surprising because I obviously know what the rent is there, but also I can see why. I think we extrapolated it on the thread that it was like eighty five, eighty seven bucks a square foot. Yeah, and I don't know what. Pad. Yeah, and I is is that how I many? I didn't know There's how many. Twenty-five k, and they have just over three thousand square feet. Right. Well, I mean, and that and that probably 25K does. A month. It probably does include. I'm assuming maybe includes the the cam fees yeah. and the stuff yeah. like that, which normally when you talk price per square foot and commercial doesn't necessarily. Yeah. You add that on top, um, and common area maintenance for those watching. Yeah, and and you know, Barracks Roads cam fees are not cheap. But they have beautiful landscaping. They have roads that are plowed Christmas as time, it's, it's as it's being snow. It's snowing and the plows are out there. Like literally, the second it stops snowing, you can always find a parking spot. Yeah. And as a business, it's huge. Yeah, I you know I'm willing to pay that because that's what keeps it the key shopping center in Charlottesville is the fact that they're doing those things. So, um, but anyway, but you know, I, I, I mean, I can see why, you know, a local business is, is probably not going to be able to do the volume to make that make sense. But it's also, I can see why Barracks Road's putting that price tag on it. Throw this to you. This is a tough question. What is, what do you think the future is of two key, I think the two most important shopping quarters in Charlottesville are the downtown mall and Barracks Road shopping center. Mm -hmm. They're in a lot of ways, and I hate to say this because I have so much skin in the game downtown. Like, my kid's future college fund <laughs> right. is tied to right here. Right. Literally. Mm -hmm. um, in a lot of ways, I can't, cannot believe I'm saying this here. In a lot of ways, I think they're heading in different directions. I think Barracks is going super, super strong. And yeah. I think what's happening in downtown Charlottesville is people are coming downtown for the restaurants yeah. and for the music and to go to happy hour and to go to the bars and to hear some cool music. Yeah. And they're not necessarily leaving with bags in their hands where people are going, and I'm going to get catch a lot of you-know-what for saying that. Right. And a lot of people are going to barracks literally to leave with bags in their hands. Right. Well, I mean, I have to say, I don't know anything from the business perspective, the downtown mall, from a consumer's perspective yeah. but you know of the business, downtown mall. Though. I agree. Yeah. I mean, when I come to the downtown mall, honestly, mostly it's... To eat, right? Exactly the things you just mentioned. Um, I know for a fact that 
at Christmas time, which is obviously the most important time yeah. for retail, um, you know, families are able to come and they do all the time. I, we get the interactions and they split up and everybody goes different ways in Barracks Road and they all are I've got, so many times. they all have their hands full of shopping bags and they were, did their shopping for, you know, the kids with the dad, for mom and this and that, and everybody's in different places and they can knock out all their shopping. Yes, I know the traffic is not great at Christmas time, but you can park and shop for four hours and get, knock out a ton of stuff and still get that feeling of shopping and Christmas spirit and all that holiday stuff that you can't get by just clicking buy, buy, buy on Amazon. And I think Barracks Road definitely hits that better than any place else in Charlottesville. What is the, okay, here's this question. And you're crushing this interview. Literally, we're 50 minutes in here. What is this question? What do you think you would do as a savvy businesswoman and someone who's taking a brand to a next level? and is literally beating down the beast that is Amazon. What would you do if you had autonomy and influence with this eight and nine block downtown quarter? What would I do? Yeah. What would the advice <sighs> you would give to the DBAC and us? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think that, honestly, I think that probably the biggest thing that's the biggest impediment down here is... Do you is think it's the parking? Is that what yes, you're going to say? I, really? Because people are trying to fight that stigma. I know they are, but honestly, people want to be, here's the thing, right? If, if you're up against Amazon and the convenience is delivered at your door, right? You don't have to find a parking spot. You don't have to do anything. You can have it purchased and at your door and like that, like while you're at the stoplight and yet sometimes you the same day. Right. And so then you think about the prospect of finding a parking spot, walking, it might be cruddy weather. I, I mean, you know what I mean? It's, it's, I, think that's, I think that's a huge hurdle. And unfortunately, I don't know how one solves that hurdle with the, you know, at hand. The constraints. Like what's physically going, you know, it's just there's, uh, you know, sometimes there's just certain things that you can't. So I think the fact that we're much more convenience driven has made the hurdle higher for, for downtown because I think that's always been a hurdle, is yeah. it hasn't been super convenient. And now that we're very focused on being a very convenience-driven purchasing market, that's, that makes it even harder. Um, I think you, unfortunately, are very uh, on point with this topic. Um, all right, uh, a couple more questions, and we're going to wind down. Mm -hmm. You're, what do you think is going to be, how do you see um, Barracks Road evolving? Over like, and you probably know, yeah, like I five, mean, ten years. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is is what we've seen happening and is continuing is um, because because retail is becoming harder. Uh -huh. Like a lot of businesses are changing with that. I mean, definitely we've had a much higher uptick in restaurants, and I think that's probably. You think that's going to continue? I think that's probably going to continue. Um, I I think that I mean I think that. I think because of its physical proximity to the university, because it's owned by a very savvy real estate agency, I mean, I'm, I, I know that it's going to continue to to do well, um, but I definitely think it's going to continue continue to evolve. I think it's probably going to be in the realm of continuing to have more restaurants. I mean, the discussion is, of course, in general in the retail market, some of these types of footprints that are kind of like um, outreaches of websites where, and I, I would imagine that if any of those are interested, so for instance, like a showroom, but that you don't actually walk away with the product, but that you walk in, you look at the stuff. You can touch it. You touch it, but they're not actually selling the merchandise. They're ordering it for you, and it's still coming to your door two days later. Um, like those types of places, I would think that likely, if any of them are going to open a place in Charlotte, it will be Barracks Road. So my gut says in five years there will be some of those probably. Interesting. If that does continue to do what the what I what it, I'm hearing is going to be the new wave. Um, so some of the showrooms, um, I would imagine there'll probably be some of those as well. I think, and I'm going to throw this to you. I, you got me, my wheels are spinning here. I think the future even of restaurants, and this is just two people shooting the you know what here. I think the future of restaurants with the millennial and the younger base is may not even be sit in dining in the restaurants. Mm -hmm. We are so accustomed because of the ubiquitous nature of these right. to just using some kind of delivery app. 
right. and having the food where we can sit in our underwear on our living room table <laughs> right. and stream Netflix right. and not worry what we look like and eat that food at our home. So I'm wondering in like the next 10, 15, or 20 years, mm -hmm. if the sit-down restaurant, the white tablecloth restaurant, the sit-down restaurant has right. to evolve their model, and we're going to just start seeing restaurants almost be, like your term, a showroom for food that right. is then sent to your house for people to eat. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Grubhub, I mean, there's a lot of, that definitely is a trend that's happening. I mean, I think that's one of the things that's unique about- Does that scare the hell out of you? A little bit, yeah. I mean, definitely a little bit. I mean, that's one of the things, though, I think that, I mean, that's one place that, like, I think the downtown mall and those restaurants and stuff, I mean, there's always going to be date the night. The ambiance. There's always yeah. going to be special events yeah. and special things that people are always going to want to uh, have a nice experience out. That's always going to be there. And that's where, you know, I can see how that's going to, Would I, I would be surprised if that, I mean, though, I, I don't know what that's going to mean for the numbers, but it probably will always be there. And similarly with barracks, I mean, like I said, the proximity to the university is just huge. I mean, that's that's really the biggest thing. I think that that's going to always, you know, help propel it. But you crushed this. Last question. Um, give us the, you know, what we can expect from the Happy Cook, say, next few years. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think the biggest thing that we're moving towards, evolving, and doing more with is just expanding the cooking classes. That's been sort of the new fun thing that we've been really into. I think um, just continuing to see those merge with the retail and the cooking classes. We really want this to not necessarily just be a cooking school and a retail space, but just that sort of merge together of the two of them working together and um, continuing to be a part of the foodie community of Charlottesville. So I think that's just going to continue to grow. You know, just because you've got the hamster wheel uh, turning here, spitballing with you, if you guys took your in-person cooking classes and you just did it yourself with your team and you live stream the cooking classes and you either use them as a freemium model where you position the content on your website for free for people to see or you charge a small monthly fee to access that content mm -hmm. from the comfort of their home, people can watch the cooking class on here mm -hmm. and if they fall in love with it, then they go into your store and then they take the cooking class in real person. You and Steve and the team could do that. Yeah. We have cameras in place that are related to for the students there yeah. to see it. Everybody keeps saying we need to stream. <laughs> it would crush. I know. I know. There's a part of me that's like, but it's not the same experience. But are you are you concerned then people would just watch the stream and not come in person? I don't know about that. I feel like it I don't know. It's just the experience in the cooking school is so wonderful that I don't feel like you can get that from the video. You know what I mean? I don't feel like it can represent it. It wouldn't be the same. No. But yeah. It but yeah, no, that, that discussion has, has occurred. I love it. Follow them on Facebook. Go visit them in person as everybody is putting on the stream. Um, like we're seeing right now for Jennifer, she's saying shop local. These people are fantastic. Jacqueline Gre Greiger, the events coordinator of Barbecue Exchange is watching. Um, so many people are giving you props like Lisa Moon here and saying shop local. Um, community loves you guys. Thank you. We love you too. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for coming on the show. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate we'll it. we'll archive the show in totality on ilovesevil.com. Judah Wickhauer, our director, is going to take the content from today's show and put it on the website. We'll turn it into a podcast on iTunes by Close of Business today. And for the next two weeks, we will syndicate it across our network, which is 17 Facebook pages, 17 Twitter accounts. We have the third largest Instagram in the community, a newsletter that goes out to almost 130,000 inboxes every morning at 11 a.m. This is the I Love Seville show where we showcase the best of Charlottesville, Virginia, and I think Monique and Steve and the Happy Cook embody that statement. I close the show with the same message every single day, and it's please embody the golden rule. Treat the folks in your life how you want to be treated yourself and watch the positive viral impact it will have across our community. It's the golden rule. Charlottesville needs the golden rule. The country needs the golden <laughs> rule more than ever. Uh, I'm Jerry Miller. This is the I Love Seville Show. We're going to tell the story of the juice laundry. Um, I just booked this interview. Is it for next week? I think it is for next week. Um, so follow closely as we uh, spotlight entrepreneurs in the community doing good things. Take care, guys. All right. No, thank you. Yeah, thank you for seriously. having me. Um, one more thing. We're just going to take a quick pick here to package this. And then we'll chat.